and hello everyone. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, welcome to It Didn't Start With You, Identifying and Treating Generational Trauma in the Black Community. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I didn't know if you all would be able to see my video here, so I put a picture of myself, um, but my name is Ashley. Um, I hold a master's in clinical mental health counseling from the University of Central Florida, and I also have a graduate certificate in couples marriage and family therapy, and I'm currently a doctoral student in counselor education and practice at Georgia State, um, where I am examining generational trauma um, from a research standpoint, so that's really exciting. As a professional counselor, I um, see individuals, couples, families, and I also run groups. Um, the majority of my clients are African Americans. Um, I also identify as African American, um, and so I wanted to kind of put that out there, my positionality as a Black woman. Um, so I'll be sharing a lot of research. Um, I will also share some personal experiences with you all, and I will encourage you to share those same things at some point. Um, so before we move on, I wanted to see if this will work. I'm kind of um, getting experimental with technology here. Um, but I wanted to um, have you all participate. I like to know um, who it is that I'm talking to. And so if you could um, respond to this poll, you can either use your web browser with this link here, or you can use your text message feature on your phone um, to text this counselor ash 962 um, to 22333. And then once you join, you can select your primary role. Just let me know who you are, whether you're a student, a practicing clinician, a clinical supervisor, or a professor or faculty member. And so we'll give you um, a few moments to respond to the poll. Any preference for both or more than one thing? Um, if you could select your primary role, so what you would describe is what you're doing most of the time. Thank you. All right, let's see the poll is jumping. Got mostly students so far. And I will have a little disclaimer. I see there's about 39 of us on here. Um, like I said earlier, I am a student and so I have the very basic <laughs> um, version of Poll Everywhere. So I think it will max out at 25 participants if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so, yeah, we'll see. Um, for the most part, it looks like mostly students, um, some practicing clinicians, and some professors in the rooms. Okay, next I'm interested in who you primarily serve. So if you work mostly with children, um, go ahead and select A. Um, so that's ages zero to nine or adolescents 10 to 19 um, adults 20 plus if you work mostly with couples or you do mostly family work um, let me know what kind of work do you do and i see some responses in the chat box too Okay. okay, so mostly working with adults, with adolescents and children, I'm following closely behind. I'm going to talk um, a lot about that to about how um, signs and symptoms of generational trauma might show up within these populations. Um, so stay tuned. And then I have one more poll for you. I am interested in when you hear generational trauma, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And so this is a word cloud, so you can enter one word, a phrase, um, or just what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear generational trauma? Um, 
All right. And again, I see some comments in our chat box too. Okay. Okay. Slavery, cycle, epigenetics, oh, lots of words. And if I'm not mistaken, the word that is sent in the most is the one that's the biggest. And so it's interesting. I see slavery, trauma, cycle, and racism as some of the more predominant words here. Okay. So what I'll do now is uh -oh, exit out of here. Hang with me for just a moment. Okay. So thank you for participating. Um, I really wanted to kind of test that out in a web format. So I appreciate that. It seemed to have went um, smoothly and I appreciate um, getting a chance to know who I'm talking to and what you are um, doing with the majority of your time. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about existing literature on generational trauma in the black community. Um, we will also talk about how signs and symptoms of generational trauma show up within African American children and adolescents, as well as adults and couples and families. And then we're going to talk about some strategies, some approaches, and some interventions that you could infuse into your practice when um, working with generational trauma with African Americans. All right, so we'll jump right into it. Um, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Um, define trauma as an event, series of events, or a set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and has adverse effects on the individual's functioning. So that is a mouthful. But with this in mind, I'm thinking of if that's how we're defining, you know, plain old trauma, we can't possibly think that um, trauma is kind of like a one-and-done experience or the type of effect that can't be like impacting another person um, or it's something that's passed on um, from parent to child, generation to generation. And so that kind of got us thinking back in the 1960s is when generational trauma research began. Um, and this happened when there was a big influx of the children of Holocaust survivors flocking to therapy in large numbers. And so again, this really got us thinking like, what is going on? Like these are children who didn't experience this traumatic event and they were the children of those who did. Um, but yet yeah, they are coming to therapy, they're being diagnosed, they're you know, receiving lots of treatment and services. Um, and so we started to wonder what might be happening. And then the terms historical trauma, generational trauma, group and family trauma, like all those different types of terms were used. And some of them are interchangeable. Some of them have a slightly different definition. But for today, I'm going to be using the term generational trauma to talk about the effects of trauma that are passed um, down from generation to generation. And so again, this curiosity from the um, children of Holocaust survivors kind of spread to other populations. If we know that an individual doesn't need to be present um, for a traumatic event in order to be impacted by that event, what does that mean for others who've survived, you know, genocide, slavery, et cetera? And so we know that generational trauma is not necessarily a new concept in the African-American community. Um, people might have been aware that, you know, hey, how my grandparents um, were raised or how they raised my parents or the things they've experienced somehow impact me, but maybe I don't really know why. Um, or they know that the things that their grandparents and parents experienced have impacted them in some way. But we know that we often look to research to um, explain or further explain or even like shape or define our lived experiences. And so we're going to kind of talk about the tussle with that today about how we kind of honor lived experiences while like exploring them in research. And I'll even share a little bit about my own research myself. So I think it's important to acknowledge um, just an understanding of the types of traumas or traumatic events that African Americans as a whole have experienced. So with the Middle Passage, it's estimated that millions of American Africans died during this forced journey from West Africa to the Americas and the Caribbean. In order to rationalize this harsh treatment of African slaves were reduced to a subhuman status and labeled as primitive, which led into American slavery. You can see from the image on the right, which is one of my favorites, it's a model of how long slavery lasted. And you can see um, just that, you know, we're talking over 300 years before segregation even began. And you can kind of see where we are 
in the 2000s, but this is something that lasted for a very long time um, with relation to other events in, in our past. Um, and so the continued racial inequality of all these events and the things that we experience today um, as African Americans, we still face you know, disproportionate and continued racial inequality in, in society. And so keeping all this in mind, um, there was an article that really um, got me thinking about this and it's called, um, it really got at residual effects of slavery and it's by Wilkins et al back from back in 2013. And basically what they were saying was that slavery continues to shape societal dynamic, dynamics even today. And so with that, um, there is a belief that African Americans were inferior. Um, and so this is something that was um, proven, and I don't know if you can see me, but I'm using air quotes right now, proven um, in literature, and African Americans were dehumanized. Um, that led you know, through abuse and all these things that led African Americans to be um, or feel very powerless. Um, and with that, you kind of become really passive just as a way to survive. And so we see some of that today as a residual effect of slavery is passivity as a way to survive. We also have seen identity conflict as a residual effect of slavery. And this is just the idea that many other groups who've experienced genocide or misplacement, you know, they still have their same last name. Um, they still have a lot of their cultural practices where that this is not the case for African Americans. Um, we were stolen from our um, homeland and names change, complete disconnect from our home cultures. And so there's that identity conflict of, um, if we are African American, like to what extent are we African? To what extent are we American? Like that sort of thing. And we consider that a residual effect of slavery. And then another residual effect of slavery is cultural mistrust towards whites. And so we have a few more. Um, I really recommend, I have this as a reference in the, um, on one of my last slides, but I recommend reading this article if you're into this sort of thing. Um, it's really, really interesting and I could have like spent the whole presentation talking about this article. Um, but something that really, really um, stuck out to me was how they talked about um, effects of slavery in terms of the socialization of children. And so we know that a primary function of family is to aid in the successful socialization of children. Um, however, slavery required enslaved parents to teach their children how to survive in the midst of some very dangerous conditions. As a result, many African American children are socialized not to challenge systems of oppression um, because back in the day that could have meant death, right, or um, loss. It could have meant being ripped away from your family. And so um, this leads to, again, those feelings of powerlessness, um, different types of family organization, and again, loss. Um, Another, you know, I guess side effect of that fear of loss is African American parents um, having difficulty giving their children praise. So we know that enslaved children who experienced puberty and gained adult competencies were frequently taken away from their parents at that point. They could produce um, labor and they could be taken away. And so with that, you have a child who is walking or talking or learning how to do, you know, this specific task. And if we reinforce it, if we praise it, they keep doing it. And that means that they'll be taken away. So at this point, I no longer want to praise my child because this might mean that they get taken away and they might continue doing this good behavior. Um, at the family loyalty overriding the needs of the individual. So again, um, this is out of a need to survive. Like we have to kind of stick together, like that sort of thing. This is all going into how children are socialized and how um, we raise children. So I have another poll for you. I'm interested in this question. So this is a true or false question. Um, the use of corporal punishment is a residual effect of slavery. What do we think? Do we think that's true or false? I'll give a couple more minutes. Most people saying true for now. Some saying false. Chat box is chiming in too. Okay. 
So um, for the sake of time, I will share the answer. Um, so this is actually somewhat of a trick question because this is one of those topics that is constantly debated upon in the literature. Um, we have the American Psychological Association that's compiled a good bit of literature that gets at how African Americans adopted the practice of beating children from white slave masters. Um, they claim that Europeans were the ones who brutalized their own children from or prior to crossing the Atlantic, while on the other hand, um, some West African societies hold that they had, they hold children in a higher standard, um, and that um, there are some historians and anthropologists that say they found no evidence of ritualistic forms of physical discipline of children in pre-colonial West African societies. And so it's kind of a toss up, like I've heard some clinicians say, um, yes, this is a residual effect of slavery, but then I've heard um, like some West African scholars say like this, you know, in some societies like this was not a practice before. So it's kind of one of those things that's, that's up for debate. But as you can see, um, African Americans nor um, West Africans are a monolith. And so different groups may have had different practices um, and endured different things and had different outcomes. And so it sometimes can be difficult to make a hard, you know, take a hard stance on some of these statements. And so this was a trick question. Um, we're not really sure. Um, literature says different things and different groups say different things. And so, um, yeah. So thank you for participating. And I see the chat box about the differences in the studies and I actually have those in my references. So I'll be sure to share them. Okay. Jumping back into it. All right, so this is another one of my favorite resources. Um, it's a book by um, Dr. Joy DeGray called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And it's obviously a play on the DSM diagnosis of um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is a book that really gets at um, kind of what um, the Wilkins article talks about, but from a more like individual and um, like child standpoint. And so it talks about how um, in the face of trauma, um, those who were traumatized African Americans adapted their attitudes and behaviors in order to just survive, and that these adaptations manifest today and they continue to develop as the world changes and we continue to adapt to this world. Um, one of my favorite quotes from this book is that American slavery was the economic cornerstone on which American wealth and power were built. Wealth and power which lasts to this day, as do the psychosocial consequences of American slavery both for the descendants of the enslaved as well as the descendants of the enslavers. And so this really stuck out to me because when we think about wealth and power and um, we think about, um, for me, I know I think about like privilege and oppression um, and how some of those things can show up, whether it be like economically or within the public health realm, we think about even with COVID-19 and how we're already seeing disproportionate numbers of um, black folks dying of COVID-19. And so we think about how these have effects, you know, even beyond the counseling room and how it could be something more physical, it could be economic. And so we think about how these changes are even present um, today, starting from the middle passage in slavery. And so I wanted to address the kind of nature versus nurture debate when it comes to generational trauma. Um, the nature side of things, I don't know if you all have heard about like epigenetics and how there's this idea that when we experience a trauma, our gene expression can be modified epigenetically, um, and this can then in turn affect physiological systems that influence our functioning. Um, we know that, um, or think about kind of like twin studies, right? Like when you have, you know, two twins that have the same DNA or whatever, and they have different experiences, but they may have like very similar outcomes. So is said to have a very like nature or like biological effect um, of trauma. The other side of that um, is the nurture side that says, no, it's really the socialization and the modeling processes that matter. Um, and so it's outside of the scope of this presentation um, to get to the root of this debate. Um, but what I'm saying is that um, we know that there are some components on the nature side as well as components on the nurture side and so how are we going to um, manage or deal with that in the counseling room? So when talking about generational trauma, I think it's also important to talk about generational resilience. So again, we know that African-Americans have developed very strong adaptive behaviors in, um, in face of stress and trauma over time. 
Um, we know that there has been a relentless amount of hopefulness um, and um, another positive that um, African Americans hold is extended support networks. So we know that African American families cope by banding together, forming extended support networks among kin and neighbors. And by doing so, they end up prioritizing the group's needs over individual needs. And so this results in stronger bonds. Um, what else? Yeah, I think just the fact that African Americans still exist in the United States today, like even with persistent oppression is proof of resilience as a culture. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about approaches later on, but I think it's important to not only focus on the trauma, but to also think about the resilience and, and the growth that, that has occurred. Um, I also wanna call attention to Bowen's multi-generational transmission processes. And so this is really that kind of nurture component, but it's this idea that small differences in interactions between parents and their offspring lead to changes over time. Um, and so this can mean um, not just, you know, how your mom or dad teaches you to do something and that means you're going to teach that same thing to your kid, but it could be down to like emotions or beliefs or approaches or things like that that are more nuanced. Um, so for example, um, like I said, child rearing, rearing and socialization of children. Uh, but another um, something to consider when it comes to these family multi-generational transmission processes is the concept of homeostasis, which in our family counseling world, we know that is like difficulty changing. And so we think about um, homeostasis in regard to families and thinking about that timeline again and how long these processes and cultural norms have been in place and how difficult it might be to change those things. So keep that in mind when we get to our approaches and interventions um, segment. All right, signs and symptoms. So typically back in the diagnosis world, we know that signs are um, things that can be observed by others, whereas symptoms are like subjective and maybe only apparent to the individual themselves. But we're going to kind of just talk about um, ways that generational trauma can manifest. And so I'm interested in this point in time, um, things that you might see in the counseling room. Um, I know most of us work with adults and some working with kids and adolescents or maybe even from your own personal experiences, if you identify as African-American or Black, um, how generational trauma shows up for you. And you can either unmute yourself or enter it into the chat box, um, whatever works for you. Okay, let me check in the chat. Hypervigilance and anxiety from the chat box. Imposter syndrome. Yeah, that's a big one. Well, other things you all see in the counseling room or um, in your own lives and families. Don't be shy, you can unmute yourself. I see stereotype threat, resiliency in the chat box. When working with my client, an African-American nine-year-old girl, she expressed how she was sorry for being a chatterbox, so not speaking too much or being too loud, okay? Substance abuse, apathy within African-American males, chronic stress, comfort and anxiety. After putting my picture up on a website, I have many more black and brown clients who choose me because they want an understanding, absolutely. Um, fear of inappropriate healthcare because of discrimination, absolutely. I think even just getting into the room is a big deal, right? <laughs> um, that mistrust is, is real. Okay. Um, we've got a couple more. Self doubt due to feeling of not being good enough. Absolutely. Emotional eating. Yeah. Um, the feeling of needing to be someone else in public. So maybe some discrepancy between authentic self and who we present to the world. Um, isolation. Absolutely. 
Um, as a counselor educator, I see students who are highly anxious about making mistakes or fear of judgment. Oh, that's a big one. That's a big one. Within my family, I see my mom experience a desire to heal. So some of those resilience pieces, absolutely. Evidence of the strong black woman persona playing out. Yes, um, that's a whole nother presentation, <laughs> but absolutely, yes. Um, feeling fundamentally flawed, yeah. We can even consider how that kind of goes back to this notion that, you know, Blacks are inferior in some way. Yep. Code switching, I see the switches turn off as an African-American counselor for sure. The fracture of family due to male-female conflict, absolutely. So it seems like you all see and maybe even experience a lot either within your own lives or in the counseling room. And so this is really interesting. Yeah, I fracture the family due to male-female conflict and the obligation to my Black students sometimes to their detriment. Ooh, that's a good one, Dr. Ford. Yeah. Okay. So hold on to those things as we start to talk about approaches and interventions. You can maybe kind of consider how some of the specific things that you mentioned and like how these interventions and approaches can be applied to those um, scenarios or presenting concerns or what have you. Okay. Uh -oh. Okay, so this is just a short, compact list of what you might see in the account room, and I think it's important to keep in mind that each of these populations, whether it be children and adolescents, couples, and our families, um, face, you know, all the traditional issues related to being a kid, to um, blending a life with someone, to building a family, like all the traditional challenges and bumps and humps on top of the generational trauma pieces as well. And so um, keeping in mind that there's like this, this um, I guess, compounded effect of, it's already difficult being a, children, a child or an adolescent in today's world. It's already difficult trying to, to, you know, unify with someone else and all those things, but keeping in mind all the effects, um, residual effects of slavery um, and generational sorts of issues that come up. So um, when it comes to children and adolescents, I could speak on this all day. Um, and so maybe even some of the educators in the room can attest to this as well. And those of you that work with kids, um, but we know that historically African societies are based on kinship relationships. So you might be seeing a child or adolescent who might feel disrespected or um, undervalued, or they may feel like their teacher doesn't believe in them. And that causes them to check out and not even want to try. So this is to the point where they don't care about that star. They don't care about the cash for the school where they can go cash it out at the school store. They don't care about the report card because the relationship has been severed. The relationship has been damaged. Um, and so they may come to feel like, well, you know, why should I try if Miss so-and-so doesn't care about me, doesn't believe in me? Um, the relationship is really like the emphasis there. And so we see that evidence by, you know, that same child who soars when they get with the teacher or um, some adult in the building who really pours into them and cares about them. You see a whole different kid, right? And so that might be that residual effect of slavery of it being um, really, really heavy on the relationship and that that's where the emphasis is. So I saw um, earlier that someone mentioned that they did counseling in the prison system. And so we see this all the time with kids and how they kind of fall into the school to prison pipeline. A lot of the things that you all entered into the chat kind of contribute to that, whether it be like a feeling of inferiority. And so it may be where why I feel like I can't succeed in math, like I should just skip class. And then at this point, I'm, you know, becoming a target at school for the school SRO or the administration or the dean or whomever. Um, and we know how that happens. Again, that's a whole nother presentation on the school to prison pipeline. Um, but we know that that can start there and those um, internalized feelings contribute to our kids and adolescents falling into that trap. We know that low self-efficacy is a part of that as well. Um, and I think it's important to know that this can be, many of these things can be attributed to a number of different factors, but I think it's worth our time and attention to consider ways in which, again, it didn't start with them. It didn't start with, you know, the, the kid picking on them at lunch. It started from this belief that because I have this skin tone or because I have this lineage or this, this, um, this background, um, I am less than and that I don't deserve as much, like those sorts of things. We see a lot with our um, adolescents and risky behaviors. And so this might look like um, participating in gang activity or it might look like hanging out with the wrong crowd or 
um, doing things that are really dangerous that could involve and harm, whether it be like jumping off of something really high or, you know, driving this car when I don't have a license, like whatever the case may be, um, risky behaviors. And then we also start to consider how these things might be tied to that low self-efficacy and that low self-esteem and how this can be a way for adolescents to engage in what we call like invited suicide, right? And so we see this sometimes when we have um, a child who's really struggling or a teenager who's really struggling mentally or emotionally and, um, you know, gets to the point where they die or, you know, got, you know, unfortunately they end up passing away or um, being murdered even by the police or by someone else. And so we start to wonder if this was a risky behavior that, you know, they didn't think that this would have affected them in this way or uh, what we would call invited suicide, like as a way to, um, to attempt and complete and die by suicide um, at the, I guess, at the hands of someone else. So we see that a lot. When it comes to couples, I actually wanted to touch on one more thing with children and adolescents. Um, I wanted to talk about standardized tests for a bit. I know that we are in um, a time period where some of those things are being canceled out due to COVID-19 and everything being moved online. Um, but we know that at the end of the day, they're not going anywhere. Um, they're going to have to do their SAT, ACT, and all those things at some point. And we know that oftentimes our kids have an issue with those tests. Like they have a long history of racism um, with intelligence and aptitude tests. And so there's an opposition or um, just a general like defiance towards those tests. And so we think about behaviors associated with that um, as teachers are prepping for those tests throughout the year. So that might come up as well. When we think about couples, um, there's a lot. And so we think about just the impact of family disintegration. So think about how for more than 300 years, our families and couples have been ripped up, right? We've been considered bad together. Um, and I'm wondering like with this, and this is kind of like a rhetorical question, but I want you to just think about, you know, when we've had 300 years of having our families ripped apart, what types of beliefs or habits do you think come from that, right? And so I think that's the difference between African American families and any other um, family or couple system in, in other ethnic minority populations is that, you know, these, these other populations, like their families kind of stay together, whereas like a history of our families is, is being ripped apart. And so we have that. We have the matriarchy patriarchy kind of tug of war. And maybe you all have some personal experiences with that, but this is really the idea that like in many families, like the father is the dominant one. Um, even we think about slavery, like the dominant person in the family was the slave master, right? And so even if the master is not like literally the father, like he's figur figuratively the father of this family, right? And so um, as time passes, you know, he becomes the imprint or like the blueprint for what um, we believe a father in a family should be like, right? And so this imprint is passed down generation to generation. And then we end up having um, fathers who maybe feel the need to um, control others through violence and aggression, right? right? And so we get to that sort of abuse as well. Um, so other things that you might see with, when, with regard to families is parents being super hyper vigilant about where their children are. So we know, I don't know about you, but as a child, I wasn't really able to or allowed to, you know, go to Sally's house for that sleepover. It just wasn't allowed. Um, we know that a lot of that is protective, it's survival. You know, if you leave my site or if you are out doing God knows what at whatever hour, like something bad might happen to you and it might result in something really, really bad happening. Um, the Wilkins article also talked about harsh oppressive home conditions. And so with this, there's this idea that during slavery times, um, it was necessary to use corporal punishment to, um, I guess, control children in such a way that keeps them safe. And so we kind of see that playing out in our families today. And that it's kind of this idea of, you know, white America is so difficult for us to navigate that I need to train you up inside the home so that you can succeed outside of it, right? So there's this idea that I need to uh, make home so harsh so that you can be successful um, when you leave the home. I'm checking the chat. Yeah, there's a lot of good, um, a lot of good comments going. Thank you all. Um, 
And then we also see the difficulty giving praise. I see this a lot, even when I have um, child and adolescent clients who meet treatment goals. <laughs> um, I'm giving them all the praise and really uh, helping them to be self-aware of the positive changes they've made. And it's hard to kind of get those parents on board um, because of this deep entrenched belief that if I give my child praise and something bad will happen, they'll either stop doing the thing or, you know, they'll, whatever the case may be, like there's, um, there's issues with praising our children. Um, we see a lot of internalized racism come about. Um, and that might look like associating all things white with good or everything that's good is, is associated with whiteness and everything that is bad is associated with blackness. And we're not waking up and saying, well, black is bad. Like we're not thinking that, um, but it comes about in the um, implicit ways in which we um, raise children. And so that might be when you start to think that your child is up to no good when they're with their set of black friends, right? Or you subconsciously want to be in that neighborhood where you are the minority and you're surrounded by mostly white people. Like that feels safer and better to you because you're associating whiteness with goodness or whatever that might be. So we see that come about as well in, in, um, in family dynamics. And I see um, someone put in here, the child also doesn't know how to accept the praise. That is so, that's common as well. We can add that one on there. Um, and that can trickle on down to whether it be in relationships and even in, you know, we see that in the schoolhouse as well. Okay. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, so I wanted to spend some time talking about treatment approaches and interventions. So I want to talk about approaches. When I think about interventions, I think about like what can we do, like activities or like things that we can do in the, in the counseling room. But when I think about approaches, it's more so like how we are conceptualizing a case or um, how we are maybe even going about planning interventions. And so I think it's important to first examine your own personal beliefs. Um, so this is, you know, your personal beliefs about slavery, about African Americans today, right? Um, or even about transgenerational processes. If you're one of those people who feel like, you know, oh, um, it doesn't matter how you were raised, like you are responsible for turning your life around and being successful no matter what, right? Examining like whether or not that is helpful or harmful to your client. Um, examining how you feel like that might impact your, the way that you um, give these interventions, right? So it's important to kind of understand who you are and like what you believe about these processes and how they might impact the work that you do with clients. I think it's also important to acknowledge the stigma of seeking counseling, like we, some of you all put in the chat box. Um, sometimes I feel like getting them in the building and, and on the couch is a big win, um, especially clients that are first timers in counseling, like just acknowledging that them getting to that point where they're seeking professional help, and especially if you are not a clinician of color, um, knowing that them seeking help is um, a really big step. Um, and so another approach is to really focus on improving self-esteem and managing anger overall. Um, Dr. DeGray in the post-traumatic slave syndrome book talked a lot about anger. Um, I didn't really focus on that today. I kind of just dropped that in there as one of the things you might see. Um, but that is a, a big approach is to, to treating that kind of underlying anger. And there's this idea that no matter what mood we're in or, or you know, what our disposition is that day, like there's this underlying sense of anger about the world and how we navigate the world. And so there's, there's this idea that no matter like what um, interventions you do, you want to take the approach of improving self-esteem and managing that anger. Um, and next approach is to develop a positive racial socialization. Um, so that's another concept from Dr. DeGray's book. Um, and so I encourage you all to think about the ways that your clients have been socialized. Um, and so this might come up, I know that um, everyone's like background is different. Again, like African-Americans aren't a monolith. You know, we've got people from the South, we've got people from the North, we've got people from the Caribbean here. Um, and so just thinking about the ways that your client and maybe their family have been socialized and wanting to develop um, positive um, ideas about who they are as a racial being. Um, it's also important to consider different modalities. Um, so we know that African Americans tend to be a more collectivistic culture, so it's important to consider um, family types of interventions and approaches, thinking more systemically and having more ecological conceptualizations um, is really important. <clears throat> 
And then lastly, our strengths-based lens, like we mentioned earlier, that resilience piece is so important. And I even saw that some of you, excuse me, I'm put that into the chat box. Um, and so I think it's important to not focus on pathologizing these residual effects of slavery or pathologizing um, how we as um, Black folks, African Americans are presenting today, but to really think about, it's really amazing that we're still here. <laughs> And it's amazing that this person is in front of you in counseling and what can we do with that? How can we build on those strengths um, in order to continue this, this growth and development in a positive direction? And so getting at, uh -oh. okay, getting at some specific interventions you can do. Um, and I wanted to note that, again, African Americans are diverse. Um, we know that these symptoms might show up differently um, in different people. And so Again, we're not a monolith. Um, there's no one size fits all here, but this is kind of like a starting point that you can kind of tailor to your individual clients. Um, I think it's important to name it, to say, and I quote, it didn't start with you. Like this is something that has been in your family for generations. This is something that, um, that is not new or unique to you. And in a way that's kind of normalizing um, and helping them to maybe feel like they're not crazy. <laughs> that is not this thing that they're going through all by themselves. but this is like something that is plaguing like us as a culture and a society today. And, and um, we're all working on these things and that is really normal to be experiencing um, this sort of thing. I think even psychoeducation, um, if you have that client who feels like, oh, you know, no matter what cards I was dealt, I should be here, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. You can really psychoeducate them to say, hey, there's some nature and nurture type, you know, some biological and socialization type factors that have contributed to where you are now. And you also have these amazing strength, strengths and skills. Um, how can we get you to the point where you, you know, the position that you want to be in? I find communication skills to be really important. I know that many of you noted that you work with adults individually. Um, and so a lot of times you don't have the luxury of having that entire multi-generational family in your office. Um, we know that it's more likely that you have that individual adult. And so I think it's important to maybe even like do some coaching and, um, and um, I guess delivery of communication skills so that your client can then begin those conversations with family members so that you have sort of like a trickle effect. I love using bibliotherapy interventions um, with my African-American clients. Um, there's a number of books and TV shows and movies, like an endless list. They're just some of my recent favorites. Um, the post-traumatic slave syndrome is really, um, um, Dr. DeGray is a social worker, so there's kind of that perspective, but she also shares a lot of personal um, examples and stories from her past and her with her children and her grandchildren. And so um, it's really um, a good read in that way. And there's like some historical components, there's pictures in it. So it's a really good read. It's not just for us as clinicians, I would even share it with the client. Um, there's also a novel, it's called Homegoing by Yagyazi. And it's really, oh my God, it's like one of my favorite books. Um, and so it's really, it's um, a book that follows a, follows one family um, from the point of the Middle Passage on to present day. And so it talks about just the generational um, patterns and like how things are passed on. It's really, really cool. Um, it's just, it's a really good book. So I recommend it. Um, TV shows, This Is Us is like one of my favorite shows. Like I love This Is Us. Um, and there's, if you're familiar with that show, they do um, address some of those generational patterns. Um, Blackish is another good one. Um, I've heard, I haven't watched Greenleaf, but every time I give this presentation or something similar, everyone is like, oh, Greenleaf is so good for that too. So I wanted to put that there. Um, and if you have other suggestions for books or TV shows or movies, feel free to share those in the chat so that um, myself and others can benefit from um, it ourselves or even sharing it with our own clients. And so, um, um, and so what I typically do with these sorts of things, um, I would have, you know, sometimes clients organically bring them up. <laughs> We're talking about generational trauma. They'll say, you know what, this kind of reminds me of like Randall from This Is Us or, um, or Andre from Blackish. And so we'll talk about, you know, what that means to them and how they kind of relate to said character. Um, but then we can also talk about how, and this is kind of getting into the genograms as well, but we can also talk about kind of how, you know, if this were your show, like what might you want Randall to be doing to improve things for his daughters? Or how might you want blackish to and like those types of things? Um, it's also good to kind of process. So homegoing has a lot of like visuals in it. Um, 
And so it's good to kind of process with clients, like some of the more heavier sorts of things. And so I love bibliotherapy for that. And it kind of helps to, um, when, with these heavier topics, it helps to kind of like balance or triangulate some of the more difficult conversations. And if they can identify with the character, it can then be easier to kind of relate that back to themselves. So I'm really a big advocate of bibliotherapy with this type of um, presenting concern. I also love the use of family genograms. So in my pre-dissertation study, I um, interviewed um, a number of Black women doing a phenomenalization of generational trauma. And as part of the interviews, I helped the participants to co-construct um, a three-generation family genogram identifying patterns of abuse, um, substance use and abuse, um, trauma, um, we talked about education, um, all sorts of things. Um, we talked about even physical health. And so it can be helpful to, you know, if there's a particular pattern or issue that um, your client is, is struggling with, particularly you can have them um, do the gen genogram with that theme. Um, so there's lots of templates online. Um, I typically like to just break out paper and my markers. Um, especially with my adult clients. I love having adults use um, markers and crayons and things like that. Um, but um, that's another really cool intervention. And I've um, always found that to be really helpful. Most people want to like share that with other family members who weren't present. Um, some people may find, well, I don't really know the answer to this. Like, I don't know what this person struggled with. Let me go home and ask her. Let me go call this person. And it kind of encourages them to do homework and be more, um, I guess, up to date on family history and those sorts of things. Um, so that can be really helpful as well. And it's also worth, worth the conversation. I know many times um, when we're talking about diagnoses, we don't know, you know, what uncle so-and-so, you know, what his mental health diagnosis was. We just know that something was like a little off is what they might say, right? And so we talk to family members, we get an understanding of what that person might be going through, then we can get a better understanding of some of these um, I guess more severe persistent or like very serious mental health issues in the family and you can be more aware of that for future generations so i really find some of these interventions really empowering again with the bibliotherapy and with the genograms you can um, ask them you know if they're doing a um, genogram and the bottom you know i guess tier is the current generation what would you like the future generation to look like what types of things would you like to see um, there when it comes to education or substance or um, all those different types of things, mental health challenges or mental health seeking. I did one um, where I had a client um, do a tally for like people that they know have like sought therapy, right? And so she mentioned that she feels like her family was one who was more open to therapy. So it was cool to kind of see like who within the tree um, was seeking therapy or has sought therapy at any point. Um, so that's really helpful. And it's also helpful to ask them what patterns they notice. So I like to color code. Um, so I'll maybe have like the women in one color and the men in another color or um, have, you know, if we're talking about physical health, we'll use blue. And if we're talking about mental health, we'll use green or whatever the case may be, just having them color code in a way where they can kind of see patterns um, and then kind of reflecting it back on them of what patterns are you noticing um, and what patterns would you like to see? Uh oh, goes to the next slide. Okay, some other interventions. Um, I think it's worth it to talk about case management or some multidisciplinary collaboration. Um, I talked about how um, physical health can be impacted by this. So there have been times where I've collaborated with a nutritionist. I know someone put in like emotional eating as one of the things that they've seen. Collaborating with a nutritionist, right? Um, getting those kids and adolescents involved in mentoring programs. Um, we know that we can't do it all in the hour that we have them. Um, but we know that we can connect them to things as part of our advocacy work as counselors um, to put them in a better position to be able to um, to really, um, I guess, maximize on those treatment plan interventions and goals. Um, my biggest thing with clients is always self-awareness. Um, my favorite thing to do is really just kind of hold a mirror up and say like, hey, this is what I see um, and then psychoeducate and this is what I know and this is what I feel like might be going on. I'm going to allow them to be more self-aware um, of what they're going through. And my favorite thing with clients is to, once we've kind of got all the self-awareness, is just kind of say, okay, we're self-aware. Now, what are we going to do about that? <laughs> How are we going to move forward with this newfound self-awareness of, yes, this is something that's impacting me. Um, and so we talk about how we might intervene at different levels. And so a lot of you um, see adults individually, but think about ways that you can connect that client to couples counseling or what family therapy might look like. Um, even getting them in groups, right? I know that I um, 
hosted a group for um, black women, adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, right? And what we know about group processes is that it can be helpful just being in a room full of people who you don't know, they're not your family, um, but they also share this similar experience with you. And um, it can be helpful to kind of talk about that for sake of normalizing processes and also encouraging one another. And we know that the groups are really um, helpful for that. So um, with that, I wanted to kind of, I know that I'm being mindful of time. I know that I'm asked to end in about five minutes. So I wanted to open up the floor for questions or even just comments if you have them. I left my information here. Um, this is my student email address. Um, I'm trying to get back on my social media game. And so I have an Instagram and a Twitter account where I post some counseling and mental health related things. And I have a little website going. It's a little under construction right now, but um, feel free to check me out on those platforms or reach out if you want a copy of the slides. Um, I see the chat. I will type in the book. I'll type in the book here. Um, and so if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free. We have about four more minutes. And you are all welcome. I love um, talking about this. This is um, likely going to be my research agenda for the remainder of my career. <laughs> um, so I plan on researching um, generational trauma from multiple different angles. I'm hoping to, for my dissertation, um, develop a, um, a program or some sort of intervention where I can get together a group of folks and we can really um, employ some of these interventions and, and figure out like whether or not they have an evidence base um, effect to them. So thank you all. And if you email me, I can send you the slides. So either one of these emails will work. You are all welcome. Any questions or comments? I will say also, um, so I saw my mother pop in. My mother, she's not a counselor. So I just want to shout out my mom. Thank you for attending. I think this is the first time she's seen me present at a conference. So this is exciting. We talk a lot about this stuff and we've done a lot of our own generational work. And so thank you, mom, for being here. I appreciate you. And I'll put the book here again because I know the chat box is moving really fast, but it's called Homegoing by Ya. Yazi. I think that's the one you're all asking for. I'll put the other one in there too, the post-traumatic slave syndrome. Okay. All right. Well, if no um, questions or comments or anything, like I said, feel free to reach out to me. I can share um, the copy of these slides. And I do have some references here. So if you're wanting those articles and whatnot, um, I have my images linked um, and then some of the references Hi, Ashley, there as well. I'm sorry. What was the name yeah. of the, the, the first book, the one you said was your favorite? How do you spell that again? The novel or the, um, the book by the social worker? The novel. The novel is Home Going, and that's one word. Home Going? And the author, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes, Home Going. Okay. And then, what's and then the, the author, her name is, yes, it's Ya, so that's Y A A. And then her last name is Gazi. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's spelled G as in goat, as in yo yo, A as in apple, S as in Sam, I as in igloo. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're right, welcome. I hope you enjoy. All right. Um, yeah, I hope that you reach out. If, if you email me, I will send the slides. And if nothing else, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. I hope that everyone is well and healthy and safe during this time. Um, and I hope to see you again sometime. Thank you. Same to you. Same.